Hello and welcome to Catholic in America. Today we're talking about transubstantiation. So we're going to look at what other Christian denominations teach about the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, and how that differentiates between the Catholic Church's understanding and why the Catholic Church is right. So if you ever wondered, are Catholics cannibals? Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to Catholic in America. So glad you're here with us. And of course, we're always joined by Father Tom Dillon and Father Michael Nixon. My name is Father Doug Martin. And so if you this is your first time here, if you're someone who comes to this program quite a bit and you enjoy it, if you would please like, share, and subscribe this so that other people can see it and enjoy it just as much as you do. And we're really excited too, just by all the people who've been joining us on Patreon who uh, get a lot out of this program and out of all, all the programs we have here. Um, at, um, through the studio, and so we're just so grateful to you for your support. If you'd like to support this show and other shows like it, um, please join us on Patreon. No matter what level you want to give at, um, you know, five dollars, ten dollars, uh, you know, hundred Bitcoin, whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to do uh, per month, uh, that that really does help us and allows us to to. Uh, to make these sorts of programs and to share it with lots of people. So yeah. that's a great joy. So we're talking about yeah. a cool topic today, guys, um, which is transubstantiation. And uh, that it's, it's really interesting, you know, you know, 10 years ago, just saying trans would not have any sort of connotations with anything else. But obviously, we're, we're in a different you know, uh, time, and, and that's, that's on a lot of people's minds, that word. Um, now, we, when we are talking about transubstantiation, we're not talking about gender or, or yeah. you know, sexual orientation. We're talking about something that's essential to the, our heart of faith, which is the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, and our, the Catholic understanding of that, which can sound odd for those maybe who are Christian, maybe have grown up going to church, maybe once a month they, they have the Lord's Supper. So we're going to talk about the Catholic understanding Understand the Catholic teaching about that, but I think it's important maybe to see like what what are some other Christian denominations, um, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, what do they think about about the Lord's Supper, and how does it? And then we can kind of maybe work towards the differentiation and why that difference is really important, and why the Catholic one is 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 pretty fantastic, you know. Yeah. So, so what you know, Father Doug, yeah. you, you grew up non-Catholic, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and went through a metamorphosis to to become Catholic. I went through different um, kind of variations of of different denominations. So, before I became Catholic, and this was usually one of those central things for me, um, because you know I grew up United Methodist, and we we had you know the Lord's Supper once a month, and so that may not seem like a lot for a Catholic, but for someone who's not a Catholic, that's quite a bit actually. Mm-hmm. I mean, because there's other denominations that may only do it like at Easter or maybe even at Christmas, but sometimes it's just once a year, and so we we did it every month, and and we celebrated that every month, and because of that, the the Lord's Supper was really an important thing for me as I went on in my journey of faith. So was that bread and wine that they would use and, yeah. and that would be something okay. So, yeah, yeah. Be bread and wine the, 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 you know, the institution of the Lord's Supper that we see in 1 Corinthians kind of those words being there that you know this is my body, this is my blood um, you know those words were still used as, as you know it was being as the, the elements were either being consecrated or prayed over or you know whatever the different denominations might have believed uh, was happening there and so you know, in the Methodist Church, I don't know if it was really defined very well for me. You know, growing up, I, I you know, as I got older and went to a Methodist university, a Methodist college, I, I learned a little bit more about what John Wesley taught about, um, you know, the Lord's Supper and what kind of the Methodists uh, believed about the Lord's Supper. But you know, growing up, it wasn't really well defined for me. But but you know, as I got older and understood it, you know, definitely there's an understanding of. Um, this is a very spiritual thing that's happening. It, it's it's done with lots of reverence, and it usually there's um, lots of silence, and and you know people all come forward for that. Um, it, it requires a minister to do it, so it's not just anybody that can do it, but it's usually the ordained minister who's um, over that church or over that you know the pastor of that church that, that is the one that that you know institutes this. And so the you know the understanding of it, like I said, was was somewhat nebulous. I mean, not not very well defined, hmm. um, but definitely there's something spiritual that's happening here. Um, 
And then, of course, as I as I went on in, in college, my you know my last year of college, I um, really found an affinity for Calvinism, and so that would be more of the the Presbyterian and Reformed denominations, maybe even the Dutch Reformed denominations, and and so you had a little bit of a higher understanding of what the Lord's Supper was. I mean, part of it was that um, this is the body and blood of Christ, and they would they would have called it that after mm. the, the prayers had been said, but. You know how you define that, that much less of a definition of it. I think the the key to it was is that there was a spiritual receiving of the body and blood of Christ. That Christ was present at that moment and in that time, not in the elements themselves, but by receiving those elements, what we did, received Christ spiritually. Well, what what is that spirit? What when you say spiritually receiving? What does that mean? Well, I'm not sure if, if there's a, a, a good understanding of it. I'm sure there's a Calvinist that's watching it now. They'll be like, no, you know, there's a very good understanding of it. But, but I don't think there really was. Um, the, the well, there's clearly defined how. what you meant by it. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And, but, but the how do you receive him spiritually, I, that's not defined because, you know, we're talking about God, you know, Jesus having a corporal body and how you receive that spiritually becomes a little bit of the, you mm. know, the question that I had in my mind at least as I moved forward in, in the Catholic faith and, you know, towards Catholicism. Then, of course, as an Episcopal, you, you really did run the gambit. I mean, the, the 39 articles, you know, which is what really governed the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church for, you know, several hundred years. Um, by this time, at least when I was joining it, you really didn't have that as much. And so the, the understanding had a Calvinistic kind of feel to it. But again, they really didn't want to really didn't want to define what's happening here exactly, except to say there's a spiritual receiving. And like even the prayer of humble access that was used in the Methodist church and was also used in the Episcopal church was uh, sounded very much like corporal language. I mean, if, if, as a Catholic, if you read that prayer in the, in the institution liturgies themselves, you would have said, as a Catholic, I can sign off on that because, mm -hmm. you know, that we would eat his body and that, you know, through eating his body, our souls, our, our bodies would be, or our, our our spirit, our sins would be taken away, and as we drank His blood, our spirit, our bodies would be cleansed from sin. Um, you know, all those kinds of imageries and, uh, that that was there and present was, was very clear. But in the Episcopal Church, as I went into the, more of the mainline Episcopal Church, there really wasn't a, a defined definition. I mean, you, you really could have been someone who believed in, in you know, a bare, um, bare memorial that that what you're receiving is nothing but bread and wine, and to just help us. Helps us think to about remember Jesus, and think about yeah. Jesus yeah. Yeah. all the way up to, to what we believe as Catholics, that mm -hmm. there's a corporal presence there and, and you know how that happens. Um, there was plenty of, of my friends that were Lutheran, that were Calvinists, and so just it, it ran the gambit. And so, you know, for me, you know, obviously I came to, to the position of transubstantiation as I came into the Catholic Church. But, but yeah, none of those other groups would have ever really held to that, except if you were an Episcopal and what we would have called a, a high church Episcopalian or an Anglo-Catholic. So this, this yeah. for those that, that maybe are kind of catching up with us, you know, sort, sort of within this conversation, this is what we believe when, when the priest or minister at your service, for us at Mass, says the words, you know, of, of what happened the, the night before Jesus died. And he says, this is my body. What actually happens to the bread and the wine or, or to the right. bread or to the crackers and grape juice or right. whatever, whatever people, pe yeah. people are using. Yeah. So the Catholic understanding is called transubstantiation. We'll get into kind of the whys behind that. But other denominations, other Christian um, uh, churches have other understandings of that um, that are very different than what the Catholic Church teaches. That is something important. There's something good happening here. There's something powerful, spiritual. Um, but like so, so you know, there's other sort of words that are used to describe what uh, other denominations. So, so um, transignification is is, is mm -hmm. one of them. So, so, so kind of, kind of, what, what would that mean as far as like you know that the, this sign has changed? How, how would some people approach that when, when they? when they're talking about the, the Lord's Supper or the yeah. Eucharist. So with transsignification, uh, I forget who it is that coined the actual term. There's a lot of different uh, theological thinkers, both before the Second Vatican Council in Catholic circles as well as within Protestant circles who started saying and questioning the language of uh, transubstantiation, which comes to us predominantly from Thomas Aquinas. Um, without, without getting into that, but the transignification was one popular theory, especially post-Vatican II Council, where people were saying, well, let's kind of do away with, the, with Thomas's language because Thomas's language is based upon Aristotle. So there's a lot of people who actually had a problem with Aristotelian philosophy and Aristotelian language, and they're like, well, Thomas relies heavily upon Aristotle, so let's go with some new updated terms which are more in keeping with our modern times. 
Uh, so transsignification is that there's a sign, there's a, a sign of something which is happening, and that sign transforms and changes. So like before, there's the sign of bread, but then afterwards, there's now a new sign, which is the sign of Christ. Mm -hmm. and that's why when the Catholic Church looked at that, we're like, well, that's not really quite what uh, what John chapter six really says. <laughs> right, right. So some, but some denominations will kind of see that. So the, the 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 symbolism of what's happening here is is transformed in the context of of, of our communal worship. Um, so then, so then, uh, you know, some other some other things would be. So you talk about like a bare memorial. So yeah. where, where where would that kind of you know play? If, if if someone's coming from a, a denomination yeah. that maybe does the Lord's Supper once a year, yeah. and and it's and it's something you do because Jesus did say, "Do this in remembrance That's of me." Right. So, so what, how would they understand that memorial? Yeah, I mean, they, they would really see this as more of well, I mean, the 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 more uh, Baptist term for it is ordinance. That that it's uh, an ordinance. It's something that uh, you know Christ told us to do, and so in, in for feeling that we do remember it and we do celebrate it. And so, um, but, but what they would really believe is, is that there's essentially no change to the elements hmm. that are there, that the, the bread and the wine remain bread and wine. Or, or well, for, for Baptists, it would be uh, bread and, and grape juice. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we could we could do a whole show on that, but just on bread and grape juice, um, that, that there's no real change in them, you know, substantively, uh, spiritually, um, that, that they just actually, um, they're, they're just signposts. They really represent um, what Jesus' body and blood is in the death of Jesus Christ himself. And mm. so, um, you know, Plymouth Brethren, there's, there's several denominations and groups that believe that. Probably some non-denominational groups believe that as well, and maybe even some Pentecostal groups. But, uh, but yeah, bare memorial just meaning that it's memory, it's really about the memorial itself and celebrating that memorial more so than what happens actually to the elements themselves. Excellent. So, kind of, kind of laying sort of the groundwork there of what some different people, maybe some of our viewers, are coming from different uh, denominations, different Protestant denominations, or evangelical. So they might have, you know, in, anywhere across the spectrum, maybe some Catholics too. So I think kind of before we dive into what the church actually teaches about transubstantiation to get the foundation of that teaching, which of course is from the Bible. And, yeah. and so when, so when someone's asked like, where's the Eucharist in the Bible or where's yeah. transubstantiation in the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the language comes from, from Thomas Aquinas. So it, it's, it's a, it's a, um, so the, 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 that the term, the term, the term, the term, the term, the term, the term comes from Aquinas. The language yeah. comes from, from the, from scripture. scripture. Right. Yeah. So, so where, where, we, where we look, where, where's good place to start as, as far as like looking at the foundation of, of what the church teaches. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to look at John 6. I mean, wouldn't you agree? I've got oh, yeah, my Bible right yeah. here. Yeah. So yeah. we can go to John 6 right now. So, yeah. so what, what about John 6? And, and, and when someone reads this, for, for you coming from a non-Catholic background, when you first kind of sort of diving into John chapter six, we, we call it the bread of life discourse, yeah. Yeah. 22 and following in John yeah. chapter six, yeah. where Jesus has some very strong words. How, how, did, how did that strike you? Because maybe we can all kind of share how this has impacted us, because it, it definitely continues yeah. to impact my faith now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you come with certain assumptions though. You, you come with an assumption that obviously he's not talking about you know that that you know that they would actually eat his body and blood. I mean, or, or eat his body and drink his blood. It's flesh. Yeah, yeah flesh. flesh. Yeah, he sorry, says flesh. He says, eat my flesh, drink, drink my, my blood, blood, like a hundred right. times in John That's chapter right. six. And yeah. So, and so <laughs> the assumption is is. Obviously, he's not meaning that. I mean, right. is is you know, growing up as a Methodist, I never read that, and and ever had. Well, I really didn't have much teaching on John six, you know, to be honest with you, because it really wasn't a, a big just, emphasis just, in that. I'm just way. curious for a second. Yeah, when you say that though, like, how did did you like did you read carefully, or when you came to John six sixty? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, I mean, which would, is they, yeah. which is that they said this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? And many right. walked away. Right. John six six six. Well, I mean, <laughs> lots of times the interpretation of that would be that it was the hard saying that Jesus was the Messiah. That 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 mm. really is what he's signifying, and that was the hard part for them to to understand. That there's a a, a part as well. I can't remember the verse now, but there's a part as well where it says, "My words are spirit and life." So in other words, not the not the uh, flesh and the blood but my words themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the, the point to which they were holding up. And so the whole emphasis of it, and the reason why people left was because they were understanding him to say that he was the Messiah, not that you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have a part in God, which now, you know, now looking back on it, and I go, yeah, why would they mind him saying he was the Messiah? But again, mm -hmm. some of that happens when you start to put it in context and realize who his audience is and what... Would have offended them, and what may not 
you know, have offended them. But, but yeah, I mean, that, that would really be it, would, would be that, that as you're reading that, that this is before the institution of the Eucharist. I mean, for that matter, it's before the crucifixion itself. And so, you know, why would Jesus be talking about there? So they would say there, there's got to be a different understanding to it. Because, I mean, yeah. the, the, just, just reading through John 6, and I, yeah. I can speak for myself, as I be- began to understand my family, we were converts. We became right. Catholic when I was pretty young. But so, so reading these accounts and talking about the Eucharist and going to Mass for the first time, those were always kind of connected for me. We became Christian, yeah. you know, at the same time we became Catholic. So, so my reading of Scripture has always been been through that. But in a sense, this this Jesus gives you, it's 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 he says it over and over mm-hmm. and over again. He talks about this bread come down from heaven. And his bread is my flesh. And unless you eat my flesh right. and drink my blood, you have no life within you. He who eats my flesh and drinks yeah. my blood will live forever. He who does not will, yeah. will not. You know, I mean, it, he says it over and over and over again. So for me, there's and always. Then, and then that one part where he says, literally, literally. Yeah. yeah. Verily, yeah. verily. Verily, truly. truly. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Yeah. amen. Yeah. amen. Uh, so be it, so be it. <laughs> yes. And, and those are the kind of things that won me over. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you when you did start reading you know, carefully and understanding, you know, again, the audience that that you know it wouldn't have offended them to have a Messiah there. It wouldn't have offended them for him to no, even. They were call looking himself, for a Messiah. They're excited. They're, they're excited for, to have a Messiah. That's why. And for him to even call himself the Son of God. Well, I mean, in some way and form, they would have called themselves sons of God. I mean, maybe not in the way Jesus is here, but but they would have been saying that as well. So again. That's not an offense. And so, you know, that's when you get into it, you're like, all right, what's the true offense here? What What's the reason why people are like, yeah, I just can't do this? So for those who haven't opened up their Bibles yet, who don't, don't yeah. so Jesus says this pause, over pause, and over pause again. Pause the show, yeah. read John <laughs> 6. Yeah, read whole John chapter 6. So you can yeah. just read that and you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and, and then they, they basically, they say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And yeah. there's, there's an offense within that. There's an offense too because... Eating flesh with blood in it is is, is an offense, but you know, for, you know, for, for the Jewish people, it's the Old Testament. Exactly, it's, it's the life that you know, the, the 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 life is in the blood. You basically kind of like you know, the, the blood belongs to God. Right. So there's there's something within this that's that's like it's well, very all, yeah. I mean, there's also the notion in the ancient world is that within your blood contains your soul. Right. It's so like your soul, your life essence, your, that which makes you alive was contained within the blood, which is why there are actually various different denominations in the world today that refuse to have blood transfusions. Yeah. Predominantly for that reason. It's like they believe yeah. that it's a... It's a, a transfer of life. Yeah, it's really. a, and, and soul therefore it's a, you have a blending of souls, and therefore it's, um, some would consider that to be to be wrong. Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah. that's that's a, a foundational text when, uh, when we talk about this. I want to kind of get into some of the other texts in, in, in the New Testament and then kind of flesh out why the Catholic Church uses this language of transubstantiation and really, too, why I think it's, it's a good... Um, Maybe call for other people to take seriously. Maybe they never, yeah. they've never really you know, taken seriously what the Lord says about this yeah. and the Catholic Church's claim because it's, it's it's pretty awesome. So we're going to take a quick break um, and we'll be right back talking more about this central and really important topic. Hey guys, thanks for checking out Catholic in America. I'm Father Michael Nixon, and I like to party. <laughs> <laughs> and I am Father Tom Dillon, uh, priest here in the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. I think I have the longest hair in the, probably the state, and uh, I too like to party. I like whiskey and cigars. Father Doug Martin, I'm also a priest here in the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee, and I'm married and roll tied. Oh my goodness. Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Um, <laughs> I was okay with the being married part. <laughs> 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 In Catholic in America, we engage the intersection between faith and culture. Tune in every week because no topic is out of bounds. We want to thank you so much for supporting this show by watching it, by liking, sharing, and subscribing. How else can they support the show? You can also become a patron on Patreon and support us financially. So if you support us, there's all kinds of swag. There's t-shirts, there's coffee mugs, or maybe bumper stickers. I don't know, maybe we could come up with a wig from Father Tom. <laughs> Father Tom wig would go, go a long way. So thanks for your support. God bless y'all and check us out next time on Catholic in America.
Welcome back to Catholic New America, and today we are talking to New York Conversation on transubstantiation. So if you would, again, like, share, and subscribe. We'd love for you to do that so that other people can enjoy the same content that you are. So this very important topic of transubstantiation, this, this, it's deep, it's theological, and it's, and it's really right at the beginning. We talked about John chapter 6. People are divided over this. Jesus yeah. says... Truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen, whatever your translation says, unless you eat my flesh. And the word that he uses, I think it's always interesting. Gnaw. Yeah, yeah, the gnaw. word he uses for eat gnaw. here is, yeah. is, is gnaw, and it's, yeah. it's very... Chew on, yeah, chew like on. a dog would. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah like dog. Chew, on, chew on this. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and so people leave, and, and Jesus doesn't, you know, you know they miss, he's not saying, oh, no, you misunderstood me. He says, he looks at his disciples, are you going to leave too? Yeah. And that's a very... Um, so in a sense, from the beginning of the Christian church, this this, this was a controversial thing. We even see uh-huh. it, in, and and we were talking about it before the show yeah. that that in the early the early days of the church, the Roman Empire would accuse Christians of being uh, cannibals. Right. So we made a we made a, you made a joke about that at the beginning. That <laughs> oh, you know, well, it was funny. It was a couple of weeks ago, my uh, my niece Cecilia, she asked, uh, she's about uh, nine years old now. And she came to me, and my uh, my brother in law usually asked her. She's like, "Well, your uncle's here. Ask him any questions you had." And she she looked at me, and she's like. Frunkle, she, she calls me Frunkle for Father Uncle. Yeah. She's like, Frunkle Tommy. <laughs> She's like, how is it that we're not cannibals when we eat Jesus' body in the Eucharist? Nice. And I was just like, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, but that's a, but I'm, it's not something which is just like a high theological question that is just like abstract theologians. But some people are like, just, oh, well, why are we getting to this, these abstract things? Hmm. Uh, Nine-year-old, I my, my nine-year-old niece. Like children, yeah. children can understand this concept, and it's also an important question, which is also why we should be able to answer it also in a uh, in a understandable way. So the goal yeah. then, if I'm going to yeah. set us a goal for this show, is yeah. we're going to answer. We're going to answer. Was there an, Cecilia? Cecilia. We're going to answer Cecilia's question, question yeah. before the show is over. <laughs> yeah, okay. I like it. And and, uh, and we're going to try to do it in hundred words or less. No, yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe two hundred words Maybe or less. Yeah. So I'll just read Aquinas. Yeah. <laughs> Here's Aquinas for you, Cecilia. Yeah. So. It, this is so central. If you've ever been into a Catholic church, and, and maybe some people here have, maybe they haven't, you understand that this is very central. There's, some, there's a reason why the Catholic church, we don't celebrate the Lord's Supper just once a year or even right. once a month. We do this every single day. I celebrated Mass earlier today, right. and we do it twice a day at our parish, and then on Sunday, several times on Sundays, there's tons of people that come. Not only are we celebrating, but, but people are waking up early in the morning, which is yeah. crazy to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I have to do it. It's my job. <laughs> but people that on their way to work or people, you know, yeah taking off work to, to, to come every day to receive the Eucharist, to be come there at the Mass. lunch breaks, yeah, all that stuff. So yeah. there's something really important that's happening well, here. Also, also, the other thing is, like, who, I mean, we've all seen this, but uh, other people who've been watching, especially if you're Catholic, you might have seen, like, what happens when a person takes the Eucharist and then they start walking away with it without receiving it. Yeah. Right. And, like, the seriousness. This happened last week at uh, Mass I was. I, was, I saw yeah. someone who came up, and I gave him the Eucharist, and I thought for a second, I was like, uh, I wonder if they're Catholic because they can't didn't receive it the way that they were supposed right. to, but I was just like, they were close enough. And I plugged, and I, I walked, and I told him, I was like, put it in your mouth. And then as he walked away, there's another parishioner who was like, put it in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> because we take, like, this yeah. is not something which we take like hardly. Like, this is, this is for yeah. us, is central. It's the, it's the crux. It's the pinnacle, yeah. the source, the summit of our entire yeah, you faith. You want us to go after you. That's the way to do it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, so another scriptural, um, mm-hmm. I think, aspect of this, of the church, is St. Paul talking about this in 1 yeah. Corinthians, yeah. Um, where he says he's talking about the Lord's Supper. And it's, uh, you know, um, people who date books in the Bible, you know, yeah. you know when they exactly this written say this is the first written account that we have of, of the yeah. institution the night before Jesus died takes right. bread you know uh, this is my body given up for you in the same way the cup after supper this is the cup of the new covenant my blood all this language mm-hmm. juice and remembrance of me we'll talk about remembrance of me. Um, yeah. but then this amazing line from St. Paul therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord as a person should examine himself so, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, it eats and drinks his own condemnation. So there's, right. again, this, this language that Paul's, some people see Catholics and like, you guys are a little too exclusive or too, yeah. take this too seriously, or yeah. you shouldn't chase someone down who's <laughs> obviously not received the Eucharist, but we do. If you want to see, we look ridiculous when we're wearing priest robes. Yeah. <laughs> to go, 
going down the, hot, yeah. the, the aisle telling someone they have to, you know, but, yeah. but there's, there's a seriousness with this because of what we believe about what's happening there. So yes, so this first, how does, how does that kind of inform your own um, uh, thought about the, about the Eucharist or about, what, what is Paul trying to say here? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really important because sometimes that, that verse has been translated as discerning the body, meaning the body of the believers. But, you know, in, in that aspect, I mean, there is something to that a little bit in the sense of, you know, being amongst the, the believers, you know, the, the, the community itself and receiving the Eucharist. But, but that's not what Paul's really meaning here. Paul's saying you need to understand what you're taking in your hands or what you're taking in your mouth and understand what you're doing because by not understanding that, then, then you may not have examined yourself in a way that's, that's appropriate. You may not be in the right disposition. You may not be in the right relationship, not just only to our Lord Jesus Christ, but to the church himself, uh, itself. And so, I mean, there, there's lots that go into that. And if we don't think about that, if we don't really take those things into consideration, then we could be eating and drinking damnation on ourselves exactly like St. Paul says. Well, I, and I think the difficulty in conversations like this, especially when you're translating scriptures, and I think that that's important to recognize, like we mm-hmm. are translating translating the scriptures right now. Yeah. Um, and you, when, every time you read the, the scriptures, you're translating it. But mm-hmm. when you look at the Catholic translation, the way that we translate the scriptures, we translate the scriptures through a, through a process. Yeah. And there's a consistent process. And that's why we follow the same process that the, actually the ancient Jews of Jesus' time and Jesus himself did. I mean, we know that the same process that St. Paul did. So like when you start looking at the difference between like when you're interpreting the scriptures, because some would say, well, that's a very literal interpretation of the scriptures. That's meant yeah. to be interpreted scripture, uh, spiritually. Yeah. That's the spiritual interpretation. Hmm. Yeah. But like the old understanding from the time of St. Paul, because yeah. St. Paul used this method, and this method is still the one, same one we use to this day, is that you have the literal translation, which is the surface layer meaning. What's the surface layer meaning? What's, yeah. What does this actually just mean? Is that, and that, the spiritual interpretation, which is hidden below the surface. So when you have a spiritual interpretation, now we have that defined very clearly as three different words. Right. So you have the analogical, you have the anagogical, and then you have the moral, which we don't need to get into. That maybe is a whole nother, that's obviously another a whole number of things. Right. But you have a very clear formula as well as a definition of what is the spiritual interpretation of the scriptures. But across the board, always, the spiritual interpretation, if you're going to give a spiritual interpretation to the text and say, well, this is meant to be interpreted in a spiritual way, the spiritual interpretation can never violate the literal. Correct. Mm-hmm. And so like, that's what keeps the spiritual interpretation from becoming wonky. Right, is that right. You have to we've follow. We've seen that. You, yeah, absolutely. Church, yeah. Is that you, can't, mm-hmm. you can't have a spiritual interpretation which violates the letter, you can't, it, which violates the surface layer of what is St. Paul bluntly saying. Now let's, let's look at the nuances. Would be a, a, a good example of this would be Jesus says, unless you take up your cross and follow me. Like... Yeah. Jesus actually took up a cross and walked with the cross. There, there's, and yeah. hit the, the people of Jesus' time would have known Roman crucifixions and would have seen that. Right. So the spiritual interpretation is the suffering that I encounter in my life. I recognize, oh, this is my cross. Right. Now, that's not doing violence to what Jesus said. It's Correct. based on, on the, the literal interpretation of what Jesus said, the literal events of, of the yeah. time, the, the symbolism that they would have. But I'm also seeing this, okay, spiritually, that this actually, I can't be like, well, we don't die by crucifixion anymore. So this, this yeah. scripture passage has, has nothing to do with me. Yeah. Well, but, but, yeah. but think, about, think about for a certain <laughs> yeah. sense, like even in that sense is like, but also if you divorce, if you divorce the literal from the spiritual, yes, like, mm-hmm. and if you divorce it and separate, and the, no, that's a spiritual or that's a literal or the, I only believe in the literal, not the spiritual. Right. But, but what happens there is like, what happens if Jesus did say, pick up your cross and follow me. And then Jesus didn't show us what that actually looked like. Right. Right. And so like, there's not a literal, real, physical carnational, mm-hmm. yeah. corporal way in which he actually showed this, that this was done in his body. Mm-hmm. Like Jesus showed us in his body how mm-hmm. to actually pick up our cross daily. I wanna, yeah. I wanna go, go to a word, because yeah. this a word that, that comes up, because a lot of times people say that this is a memorial of Jesus. Right. And so that word, because Jesus says at the Last Supper, we say it every time at Mass, do this in remembrance or in memorial or in memory of me. So maybe like what is our popular understanding of, of, of memorial or memory, and how does that differentiate from the Jewish understanding of it, and why, why, is, why is that distinction appro- or, you know, important yeah. to kind of, kind of understand? Because I think that, that's a huge thing where people are like, yeah, it was, it's, it's just a memorial, yeah. rather than like, because we would say it's a memorial as well, but we, yeah. we might mean something different by yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and I think we would. But I mean, you know, I think what was often taken of is, is using the, the modern idea of memorial, meaning we, we put something up and it reminds us. Yeah, and it reminds us of what that was. Oh, remember what that when was like. Jesus 
existed. Paint, but then, painting photograph, yeah. yeah that's yeah. right. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the reason why we often put up, you know, headstones to say that we can come and we we see their life. We, you know, we see, you know, they say, you know, the life happens in the dash there, but we see that when they were born, when they passed, you know, often there's things that are on it that, that remind us of who that person was. Why we have a picture of things, you know, so I can remember what my kids looked like or my dog or that time we went on vacation. I mean, right. so, you know, but but what happens in, in that is something similar. It's not exactly similar, but some of the same things is, is the reason why we want to remember those things is, is so that we can somewhat enter back into that moment. Hmm. Enter back into what was going on at that time. I mean, the reason why I take a picture of a beautiful sunset, it's not because I can't see one. It's not because I can't experience one you know, in different ways, but because that picture reminds me of that trip. It reminds me of what was happening during that time. And in some way, I can even relive that moment in, in a particular way. And so, so that has a little bit of something. Now you're starting to get a little bit more, you know, more close to what we're talking about with memorial. Yeah, well, and also, memory. like... And I think it's important to recognize like when the scriptures came about and when the scriptures were written and when all this happened, it was a different cultural world. And so like you had to go back to the cultural understandings of how memory itself and what the memory was understood at that time. And like, especially as we become very materialistic and very uh, focused on science and empiricism and everything has to have a physical, empirical, uh, rational explanation of things. But in the ancient world, like, the notion of memory, and this is not just this was not just in the Jewish faith. This is across all different cultures. Memory in the ancient world and ancient cultures was seen as a mystical a mystical connection to the gods or to God. It's like there was this notion, like I believe, if I remember correctly, that one of the ravens on Odin's shoulder, like for the ancient Norse, yeah. one of the ravens' name was Memory, because mm-hmm. this was this was one of the ways in which uh, Odin, as the high god of the Norse, like Memory was one of his r- r- messengers who went out. So like, and also like you go across like ancient Greece, you go to ancient Canaanites, you go to all these different ancient religions and you'll find this mystical understanding that the memory of human beings is something which connects them to the gods because animals don't have consciousness and memory the way that human beings do. And so like when you look at that notion of like the memory, especially like the ancient Hebrew understanding of memory, when they remembered, they believed that God who is omnipresent So his omniscience is he knows all things, but omnipresent is I am who am. So Mm -hmm. he doesn't reveal himself as I was who was, or I will be who will be, because God doesn't evolve or change. I am who am, and God is eternally always the same, but he's also eternally present through space time. And God transcends space time, and that the people of Israel's understanding, especially when you get to the Passover, is that when they remembered things, they were accessing their mystical divine memory and as a people, when they remembered them, when they remembered specifically with God, they believed that they were transported to that actual moment yeah. Yeah. through that mystical exactly. spiritual connection. That they, what they couldn't see physically, they were present spiritually. When they did the Passover specifically, and they remembered, and they did the Passover every single year, which is part of the entirety of the Jewish consciousness of that you have to celebrate Passover, they themselves were saved. Yeah. From the waters of Eve, from the and through the waters yeah. of the Red Sea, they right. themselves were saved. It wasn't just like, their ancestors. The yeah. They, yeah. as a common people, that yeah. the, Israel is a people who transcends space and time. Uh, and they entered into that sometimes by by. I mean, they would dress up for this. Dress yeah. up. Pass over. Oh, no, that's, were, that's the whole thing. Yeah. They, they ate bitter herbs. They, on, they ate matzah bread staff. so that they yeah. could heavily yep. Yep. stimulate the yeah. senses. The, the, the youngest son says to the father, "Like, why is this night different than every?" Yeah. Every other night, mm-hmm. this night we who were slaves are now set free. Like this, right. this night it's happening now, and it's yeah. interesting too that that the Last Supper, it, the institution of the Eucharist, mm-hmm. happens within the context of a Passover meal, yep. which is a sacrificial meal. A lamb has been sacrificed. All these things, you know. So, uh, so on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus, there is no Passover lamb there. There is bread and wine. And Jesus takes that bread and wine and says, this yeah. is my body, this is my blood of the new yeah. and ever, ever, everlasting covenant, do this in remembrance of me. So again, this memory, so it is, it is remembering something beautiful. It, 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 is. Is, it is thinking of like, oh my, wasn't that amazing what Jesus did or who Jesus is or how much right. he loved me or that he saved, but it's, all, but it's, it's that not, and so much more. Yeah, it's that and, and well, I think that's, yeah. that's maybe the, the, the Catholic difference that we can kind of start to, to, to play into. Yeah, and, and even as you're talking about that, the memory of it, like we were just speaking of, you know, they would have their staff and the sandals and all that, but, but also the, the, the family that, that gathered that night on that Passover had to eat the lamb. If there was someone in the house that didn't eat it, they weren't saved. I mean, they weren't protected from this Passover. And so even bringing that into the memory of it, as we are, as we are partaking of that, 
of communion itself, of, of receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We are, as the, the Israelites were and, 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 and as Jews are with the Passover, we are transformed. We are back to well, in, in, that absolutely. actual supper that happened. And we are actually receiving the body and blood of Christ as the disciples would have in that upper well, room. And I think that sometimes what's also forgotten within the, pass, within the Passover narrative of yeah. the, in which the Jews did is that to be saved from Egypt, you had to paint your blood, the blood of the yeah. lamb over the door. And that's, I mean, vis visibly, that's that's what everyone remembers. Cause you're just like, oh my gosh, you're painting blood. And so it's very visceral, it's very bloody, yeah. it's very uh, carnal. And so like it's, it's, it's this image that people have in their minds, but they don't recognize that there was a second half yeah. of what you had to do. And that's what sometimes is lost. You yeah. had to paint your blood over your doorpost, but you also had to eat the flesh. Right specifically the flesh of the lamb at every member of the house. And if you didn't have enough money, you had to go in with another household. Yeah, you share. And you had to buy a lamb and you had to sacrifice, you had to eat, everyone had to eat that lamb. And that's how you were spared from the angel right. of death. And that's how God saved. That was the process that, by which God saved his people. Right. And he, God, in a spiritual sense, loves to repeat himself. Right. Yeah. That's the yeah. whole notion of the repeating to Rosh. He's a good father. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good father. He repeats himself. Yeah. 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 We're going to get it at one point. You know, finally, we're like, oh, we finally, yeah. he said it enough times and, and, and we get it. So, yeah. so I love that too, that so the Catholic understanding that in a sense is wrestling with this reality. We have our Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. We have the revelation in, of, of, you know, the words of Jesus that from the earliest days of the church, we see St. Paul after Jesus' death and resurrection is repeating them. This is something he says, I hand it on to you what I myself received. Yeah. So this is something that is that's happening every single, you know, every single day, every single week within the Christian community. We have accounts of Christian martyrs bringing the Eucharist to those in prison and dying rather than giving up the Eucharist. Right. Now this is not just like a this is this this reminds me of Jesus. So I'm right. going to die no, to bring it to Saint, somebody. Saint Tarsicius, yeah. 13, 14 year old little boy who's bringing his beat to death by his friends because he won't give up the Eucharist. He's holding it. Absolutely. And he's going to the uh, prisons because he was the only person who could get into the prisons because he was underage. So there's a belief mm -hmm. within the Catholic Church that that the substance, the reality and uh, uh, has changed, that this actually is Jesus Christ, his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So that, that teaching, I think, is so key. When we talk about the difference of, of Catholicism, it includes all those things. Mm -hmm. the, 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 si the sign has changed, the symbol has changed, the, the you know, uh, transfinalization, the final end of yeah. this has changed. It's a memorial, it's all these things, it's spiritual, Mm -hmm. And it is so. It's all those things together, and, and. but we really, but we really believe that this is this is real. We call this the real presence of Jesus yeah. and the Holy Eucharist. Well, and that's also why the church, when they when the church was looking at the Pope was looking at and uh, Rome was looking at these different words that they wanted to update: transfinalization, transsignification, and all these different ones. They looked and they said, pretty much, we don't disagree with these words. The problem is that the words are lacking. Yeah. And the older yeah. word of transubstantiation is a more fitting, mm -hmm. is a better yeah. way because it encompasses a wider scope and a wider view, as right. opposed to these. These are more narrow. And actually, if we were to employ these various words to try to update our language, we would not be progressing. We would actually be regressing. Right. Because these we'd be these, diminishing. We'd be diminishing yeah. because they yeah. say they yeah. say less about what's actually happening right. than what Thomas. And that's why the church says in terms of the doctrine of transubstantiation, if we come up with a better word, we will get a, we will use the better word. The, the, the thing is, this is the best word we have right now, and all the words that have been offered are taking something away from what we believe as opposed to adding something to it. And we don't ever take away from our beliefs. We right. believe that our faith is the seed, a mustard seed, which grows in the largest of all trees, but it never changes its fundamental nature. So right. our faith grows, but it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. right. right, right, it doesn't evolve, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's funny that, that we've had that word around for what six hundred years, seven hundred years, something like that, five hundred at least, eight hundred, yeah, eight hundred maybe, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So we've yeah. had it around. <laughs> you know, we've we've used that word for that long, and we haven't come up with a better one yet. It's pretty right. good. It's, it's pretty, pretty good, pretty good word. word. And so it yeah. tells you there's there's some some deep truth that's there that is kind of hard to deny. And when we do, you're right. We start looking for a lower common denominator rather than coming up to where the, the truth really is and, and where it really is on the level. But then, but then well, let's go back to my, to Cecilia's point. Yeah. 
All right, Cecilia. Well, we do want to get Cecilia. Yeah. We got to answer that question. How are we not cannibals? Yeah. How are we not cannibals? Are we are we being cannibals? Are we cannibals when we eat the? If this is actually Jesus' flesh, that means that we're eating another person's body, mm-hmm. their flesh. And how does this mean that we are not cannibals? Can, we, can I take a stab at this? Yes. Okay. Please, absolutely. Sure. So so when we receive the Eucharist, Cecilia, Cecilia, yeah. um, <laughs> or whoever this might be. Yeah, yeah. So recognizing that this isn't like a mere physical, like a hunk of Jesus' flesh. You know, you know, even though the Words Jesus uses are, are, you know, has flesh, has that kind of, that this is the entirety of Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Jesus who died, Jesus who rose from the dead, Jesus who's at the right hand of the Father. You know, so when we when we receive, in a sense, we're not, we're not like, you know, when we, uh, not I love that. Pinching it off, right? Yeah, yeah, we're not pinching off a yeah. piece. Yeah. That in a sense, we're being drawn into that reality. So it's not, it's not so much like I'm eating Jesus, as in like I'm, I'm being drawn in, in into the Lord's body when, when I see it. So I receive it. I receive the t- totality of this, but I don't like exhaust the totality of it. If I right. eat, eat your finger, there's no more finger. It's gone. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know. Yeah. So when I receive the Holy Eucharist, I'm being united, and that's where you, even even some of the language comes in. We're at the banquet, but it's also it's a wedding banquet. Yeah. So some of the language of, of, of the church, you know, throughout the the years has been like we're united to the Lord in this marriage banquet, which, right. which is really we are more, get, we are more united to the Lord at the ma- marriage banquet of the Lamb than Adam was to Eve. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So so. Yeah. I'm not quite sure if I've answered Cecilia's question succinctly yet, but, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're getting there. We're right, getting there. Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, and even the, the prayer that I had mentioned earlier, this prayer of humble access, it ends with, I may become one with him that he may be become one with me. Mm-hmm. I mean, so the whole idea is, is to become one, like you said. But, yeah. Um, well, and, and, and also to understand that, you know, Jesus' body is is in heaven now, and it's a, it's a resurrected body. And, and there's some of that that we don't understand. Yeah. You know, that we're, there's some of that that we, we don't know His resurrected body went, went through doors. It went through you doors. Know, he, he, the doors were locked, and he just walks right through. So and, there's and, a, and yet he ate. Yeah, and <laughs> then he also ate. So there's something, it's still, while not being unphysical, it's right. more than that. That's right. At, at the same time. So it, there's, there's something more than yeah, that. There's something and, powerful and the, with that's that. That's the body that we're partaking of. You know, that's the... The, the body that, that we have actual communion with is the, the resurrected body of Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father now. And of course, you know, when we start talking about scriptural passages, and I don't want to get back into the weeds on this one, but you know, we see this in Revelation as well, that, that Jesus is the lamb on the altar at this point as the, the whole church of heaven, if you will, is coming in to worship. I mean, it's exactly where we get the, the mass from itself. It's mm-hmm. one of the things that convinced me of this teaching is, is that you know, we are coming into the presence of God in heaven. And that heaven is opened up. And the whole idea of lifting up our hearts when we talk about that in the liturgy itself is not that that heaven is coming down to us, but that we are entering heaven. Matter Mm. of fact, there's an Orthodox theologian named Alexander Schmemann that wrote a book called For the Life of the World. And one of the things he talked about was, was as the priest enters the congregation, it's as if this wave comes over the entire congregation. And all of a sudden, we're no longer here on earth. We're in heaven. And then that's the audience. And so that's the reason why we talk about the communion of saints. When they're gathered here at this altar, not at our altar here on earth, but at the altar in heaven, and that that's the one that we're joining. I think it also, a um, very simple level, but it's also an important one. God came to divinize our bodies. Yeah. God didn't come just to take our minds outside of our bodies and to like make turns into little... Uh, spirits. Yeah, it's not I mean, just a soul. Thing. No, we're yeah, not. Yeah. It's not about. Is that God came to divinize our body? Because in the ancient world, your flesh, your body, was seen as something which separated you and made you weak, and made you frail, and made you also limited. And so there was this notion it that kept you from God. Our bodies yeah. keep yeah. us yeah. from our body, the our yeah. body was a, Our body was a barrier to God. A body was a barrier because it's all the ways in which we find ourselves small and weak and fragile, as well as mortal. And so Jesus came into the world to make us immortal, but not by removing our bodies, as it was common in philosophy at that time, is that people said, well, you can become immortal if you become a pure spirit. You can become immortal if you get rid of your body and become pure consciousness. And like this very Buddhist, uh, which is actually kind of the Buddhist idea, is that yeah. if you want to free yourself from your body, you can enter into nirvana, this, con- yeah. this eternal consciousness where you become God. Like, but Jesus came into the world not to, not to turn us into Buddhists, he came into the world to show us that the body is not something which is a barrier to God. Hmm. 
but he came into the world to actually to take our bodies and to show us that God is capable of taking our bodies and turning it into a way to unify us to God, which is also why he gives us his body, tells us to receive his body, to eat his body, to be one with his body, not because we are decreasing Christ. We're not eating a right. eat, as St. Augustine said, we don't, we don't take a, a chunk out of, of Jesus' arm. It's that yeah. when we unite our bodies to his, mm. our bodies become divine. Have had the doorway that's to it. divinity, and so our and so when be and that's also the thing is that we can't mm. decrease him, but we can become increased through him. Mm. Right, and so by that spiritual communion, something which is happening, and I mean really, my, if I had a, a director who I think like I, this would be like a, the best Christopher Nolan movie ever. I mean, yeah. Yeah. much better than <laughs> yeah. Interstellar yeah. and things like that. But like as you see, like this backwards, like these time warps and things like that. But this is to a certain extent with the anagogical, the spiritual, mystical understanding mm -hmm. of the scripture. What happens in the scripture? Jesus gave us his body to make our bodies divine. There has and God doesn't just snap yeah. his fingers. Right. He's, God's not a God of magic. Which is why he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, right. how seriously Jesus takes this because this is, this is, the, this is the process. This is the, the order process by which, which this yeah. is the this order by which this happens. Man. And, and I think mm -hmm. this is important too because so many people who are non-Catholic Christians maybe see this as like a nice add-on that we have this, but, but recognize, no, no, this is the source and the summit. Jesus tells us you're not saved if you don't have this. Correct. So that, that's I would give an invitation for anyone who's never taken, who's, who wants to be saved, who believes mm -hmm. in Jesus, to take seriously the Catholic um, understanding, which is the Christian understanding for the past 2,000 years, yeah. of, of this is the means by which we're saved by being united to Jesus Christ, and not just like intellectually, like I think about Jesus, or even right. I, I just profess him with my lips, but I actually become one flesh with him. Right. And that, that, that to me is, is, well, is, is the whole the point of the marriage yeah. separate. The, the, beautiful yeah. thing is, the beautiful thing also about communion you don't have to understand it with your mind, mm. but you can experience it. Right. Yeah. And that's the whole thing is like, this is also where people who kind of worship the mind, where the mind mm -hmm. becomes the glorification of human beings. No, God came, but he didn't want to get rid of our minds. He didn't want to turn us into brainless, brainless dupes. He wanted to divinize our minds, but the only way he can divinize our minds is when we surrender our mind to his. Yeah. Mm. And so yeah. that's also why like, I know some of the most faithful Christians in the world, Catholics in the world, are people who don't have the advanced theology degrees. Right. They just believe, they have faith, right. and they know that when they receive the body of Jesus, that they are joined and in communion to him. Yeah. I, I think, um, uh, I would love to kind of you know draw us to a close. There's a lot more we could say about this, sure. but may, maybe we can just kind of get, share with people one thing they can do that they you know to kind of put this in the practice. If they're already Catholic or if they're not Catholic yet, um, to, to great more greatly appreciate this gift of the Holy Eucharist as the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Um, so, so I think the first one, and I'll, and I'll start here, yeah. even if you're not Catholic, something you can do that Catholic churches have, which is adoration, Eucharistic yeah. adoration. And what, what happens there is, again, because we believe that this, this bread is no longer bread, this wine is no longer wine, it still looks like bread, still looks like wine, but it is the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Yeah. So we, we keep the Eucharist, the, the hosts, mm -hmm. In the, the tabernacle, which is this fancy gold box in the church. Yeah. It looks like the, the old Ark of the Covenant. It like, yeah. looks like the Ark of the Covenant. But we'll take that out and mm -hmm. place the Lord, the Eucharistic Lord, in a monstrance and a kind of a fancy, yeah. and that means to show, and we'll actually mm -hmm. spend time in prayer. I and mean, we have a chapel at my parish, you probably have chapels at your parishes okay. as well, where people come all hours of the day or night and look at the Lord and they mm -hmm. pray, and they pray yeah. in the Lord's presence, and that yeah. helps to deepen when they receive Jesus in the Eucharist. Sometimes people who can't receive Jesus for various reasons in the Eucharist, mm -hmm. they'll still come, and there's such a, a there's so much power in that, of yeah. just that silent time of adoration, adoring the Lord, that right. that's something I would definitely recommend to people if you, if you wanna to, to grow, if maybe you're exploring this for the first time, right. spend some time in Eucharistic adoration. Right, and you know, I have a, we have a dear brother right now in our congregation who, well, he's joining our congregation, who's on the road to, to you know, he's really trying to discover whether he's Catholic or not. And uh, the, uh, he's been coming to daily mass. And of course, on Fridays for us, after daily mass, we have adoration. And he was telling me he experienced that the other day for the first time. Now, this is a guy who didn't know anything about adoration, hasn't heard anything about it, so he doesn't have a predisposition towards it either way. But he was he was sitting there, and as we exposed the blessed sacrament, he said, it, it wasn't audible, but he could hear something calling him, and he said, he looked up and said, is that you, Jesus? Hmm. And he, he had a, 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 a an experience right there, not Catholic, hasn't received the body and blood of Jesus Christ, doesn't understand what's going on up front and why this is there. 
and, and has this experience. And so for someone who does understand what's going on, and like you said, it's not Catholic yet, this is an opportunity to really experience, you know, Jesus in, in, the, in the Blessed Sacrament itself. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'd say uh, just very simply, taking the words of St. Paul to heart, and even if you're not going to adoration or you're, like, you're working during the week and things like that, but when you come up to receive communion, mm -hmm. like when you come up to receive communion, receive it and think about what you're doing. Hmm. I mean, how often, how often I see people, and I can tell the difference, I'm sure we all can, of mm -hmm. uh, the difference between a person who receives it and has discerned worthily, like come up and you receive and you think about what this actually means. And that's where like, the, by thinking, or as it says in scripture, by pondering these things in our heart. Yeah. Like the Lord, by just simply taking seriously the act of receiving communion, of also like recognizing, I'm gonna seriously do this, and like if I'm in a state of sin and I'm in a state, I'm not gonna receive this because I'm gonna take my faith seriously. I'm gonna take this Eucharist mm -hmm. seriously. Because we are called when we receive the Eucharist to not receive the Eucharist if we're in a state of serious sin. Like God wants to have a conversation, but also like taking that seriously. Like, and then when we come forward to receive it seriously and to think about, even if we're struggling with it, like the Lord still wants us to come to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he wants us to also come in to like, to not take this for granted and not just come up, it's not a cracker, it's not a cookie. Like this is mm -hmm. God who is ridiculously, idiotically showing his humility, exposing himself and yeah. vulnerability to us in a ridiculous, stupid way. But it's also because his love for us is ridiculous and stupid, or as we, it's <laughs> prodigal. It's, it's, it's prodigal. ridiculous. Yeah. And like God's not afraid of humility. And so some people are like, but that's so demeaning that God would yeah. become food, become like, why would, because he came to show us humility. Yeah. Hmm. He came to show us that humility is not something we have to be afraid of and we don't have to be scared of. He became so humble, he was willing to become food for animals. Yeah. yeah. Which is what we are. We are animals. He came to, <laughs> and he literally yeah. placed himself as food and animals from the crash, from yeah. the crib. Right. And like he still presents himself as food. Bethlehem, he's in a feeding it's, trough and he absolutely. continues it to, well, you know, today. And, yeah. and so much so that he allows us to handle him. Absolutely. I mean, or manhandle him. Yeah. That's well, right. man, yeah. I mean, you know, Which is also we, scriptural because that's what we did at the, at the scourging it, it, and at the crucifixion. Every time we yeah. sin, we manhandle yeah. him. And yeah. that's the thing. He's like, when we receive, discern what you're doing. Mm. And like, even if we're not worthy, like that's the thing. Like God is okay with all that God asks from us is a humble and honest heart. Right. Yeah. And like, that's right. why yeah. this is what he himself, he's not asking us to do anything that he himself has not shown us and is actually still showing us. Right, follow me. Follow, follow me. me, follow me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, you know, I, I think what I would say to someone who's, who's Catholic right now and who's kind of either on the fence or, or they recognize that maybe I haven't been taking this you know, seriously enough, or, or maybe I should take this more seriously, is what I would tell them is, is as often as you can. Yeah. As often as you can, daily, if you can. Absolutely. Not, not everybody's in that state, you know, of life at the moment and, and could receive it, maybe work, job, being away. I mean, especially our, our military that goes TDY, sometimes they don't see a priest for months. And so, you know, um, you know, going back on, on what you're saying about don't take it for granted. Yeah, don't take it for granted. Take it as often as you can. And, and, and you know, really come with, with that sense of expecting to receive something. I mean, Jesus has something for us there and expect to receive it every time you come. And that way you don't take it for granted. It is something that even when you do, our Lord can still reach you. But man, how much more he can when we come with a humble and a hungry heart for him. Excellent. Well, Father Tom, Father Doug, uh, great conversation. Um, and it makes me excited about the next time I get to receive the Eucharist tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would just say a word of encouragement too for you guys to check out the Catholic Church, um, to receive Jesus from the Holy Eucharist, to become Catholic in full communion with the church if you're not yet, um, because it's it, it's the best. It, yeah. it really, really is. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, I thank you all so much for for, for watching, for, for um, sharing these videos, for all those who are supporting us. And until next time here at Catholic in America, God bless. Mm -hmm.